Dear Compass course participants, welcome to the fourth lecture of Sustainable Architecture and Energy Management module. My name is Jelena Radošević. By profession, I am an ecologist working for Society for Sustainable Development Design, DOR. My professional focus is on water and material cycles and how they are and can be influenced by different society-nature interactions. I will be guiding you through an overview on, of the topic of sustainable water management in converged retrofitted public buildings. Water is one of our most precious natural resources. It is life essential for all organisms on Earth. Our bodies need water to carry out the basic life processes like respiration, digestion and excretion. Without it, our cells cease to function. In other words, we die in approximately three to five days. We live on a planet that is nicknamed the Blue Planet because 71% of its surface is covered by water, but only 3% of all water on Earth is fresh water, a kind of water we need, we can use for our survival. Of this 3%, around two-thirds is captured in ice caps and glaciers, which leaves practically only about one-third of total Earth's fresh water, or 1% of all water on Earth, accessible for life support. Luckily, water is a renewable natural resource. It cycles. But nowadays, drinkable, potable water supplies are heavily threatened by mostly anthropogenic pollution, by floods and droughts. Anthropogenic sources of water pollution are mostly untreated or inadequately treated municipal and industrial wastewaters, and fertilizers and pesticides used in agriculture that enter surface and underground water bodies when it rains. Floods play an important part in water pollution because they bring into contact materials that otherwise would not come into contact. During floods, certain chemicals are dissolved and mobilized, relocated together with other pollutants and sewage bacteria and they can reach underground clean water reservoirs, aquifers. There seem to be less and less sources of good quality potable water in the world. Around 3.5 million people worldwide die every year due to diseases caused by unsafe, unclean water. Diseases like cholera, dysentery, typhus, polio and so on. These problems urge us to think about how can we personally contribute to water pollution reduction, how much water we use and how much of it we really need in our daily life. How can we change our daily water consumption without jeopardizing our health and our living standards? Some of the answers to these questions are integral part of the concept of sustainable water management. Sustainable water management consolidates basic principles of water management in populated areas and multi-objective sustainability interventions that seek to reduce water demand and water pollution and use water resources more efficiently. New water use patterns require significant adaptations of cultural behavioral, technical, financial, institutional and political perspectives on water management. New values and habits are being adopted, innovative water efficiency appliances constructed, new water company business plans written, new efficiency targets in building codes placed, new strategic goals, policies and regulations developed. For example, in 2011 UK's Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs presented in the paper Water for Life their plan of reduction of water consumption, which is 5 litres per property over 5 years and reduction of leakage, water leakage by a further 3%. 
most efficient sustainable integrated water management system is a tailor-made one. If it is developed for a building, it is very important to know what the building is used for, because that influences the manner and the amount of water being consumed. In this course, we are talking about public buildings. So what kind of buildings exactly are public buildings? For the purpose of this course, we will define them as buildings owned and managed by public authority for public purposes, providing public services to a large number of people. These would be ministries, courthouses, hospitals, schools, museums and other types of buildings listed here. Of course, the principle of sustainable water management in public buildings can be applied to commercial buildings, for example banks, hotels, restaurants, department stores, as well as in residential buildings with some adjustments. And what is water used for in public buildings? As in many other types of buildings, for drinking, walk, washing, cleaning, heat transfer. But in ratios specific for particular use of a particular public building. Buildings are places where significant amounts of water are consumed and considerable savings can be achieved. Building managers are usually motivated to use water more rationally, sustainably, for financial reasons. And because they are aware of how precious water is and how threatened the sources of drinking water are. If the water bills are charged based on water consumption measured by water meters, citizens are financially motivated to consume less water, obviously. In the UK, water metering and charging by water consumption has shown to reduce water demand by 10 to 15 percent. Practical way to reduce water use in public buildings is to improve water efficiency of the building, install water saving devices and water efficient appliances. First step is to repair or replace all leaking pipes, joints and valves, dripping taps and toilet tanks. One dripping tap can waste 4 to 10,000 liters of water every year, which is enough water for 40 to 100 showers. Water leakage from toilets, faucets or plumbing fixtures can be responsible for as much as 10 to 30 percent of total water consumed. Next step is improving water efficiency of the building by installing water saving devices and water efficient appliances. Hmm. Wondering what the difference between appliance and devices? Well, the main difference is that appliances are always powered by electricity and used to perform a particular job. There are a lot of water saving devices on the market and I have chosen a couple of them that I found most useful and interesting to present to you. Most frequently used are aerators, which are nowadays standard parts of faucets, taps. They mix water with air and can save water by up to 50% during hand wash without influencing water pressure. Water efficient shower heads work by a similar principle. Faucets and showers with automatic shut-off systems cut the water flow once a certain predetermined amount of water has been used. And if you want to use a little bit more of water, you have to push the button to get another portion of this. This system enables water savings of up to 70%. If the building owner prefers household types of faucets, then single-handle mixer faucets are much better choice than traditional faucets. Why? 
Users of traditional faucets are less likely to turn the faucet off while soaping their hands and will spend much more water while mixing hot and cold water in search for the convenient washing temperature. Total water efficiency hit are faucets with sensors that trigger water flow when hands are near. It is essential that response time of these faucets is quick in order to satisfy the user. Laundry and dishwashing are consuming a lot of water, especially in hospitals and student homes. By using appliances like washing machine and dishwashers, you will use less water than if you wash dishes and clothes by hand. Typically washing machines use a little bit more than 50 liters of water per cycle and dishwasher use, uses uh, 15 liters of water per cycle. But there are efficient versions that use at least 10 and 5 liters less. Important part of sustainable water management is changing citizens' attitudes and behavior towards the use of water, which can be achieved through educational campaigns. Educational campaigns can be organized by authorities or the building manager to raise awareness about the value of water the need to use it wisely and to inform the staff of what to do, how to act to save water. Leaflets, stickers, video clips and games are good ways to spread the word and make it stick. After reading these water saving advices, 
and applying them in your daily life? If you have a couple of minutes to spare, check out the Test Your Water Sense. It's a game, educational computer game developed by the Environment Protection Agency. Educational campaign on how to save water does not make sense in water scarcity affected areas. People who live there know how to use and reuse water wisely better than anyone else. Potable water is used for drinking, other water quality types for other purposes. Public buildings in these areas have reservoirs where water is stored during rainy periods and periods of high river flows for use in dry month of the year or for firefighting purposes. If situated on the coast, a public building can use seawater for flushing purposes. This practice is common, for instance, in Hong Kong and ever so since the late 1950s. Even more valuable than seawater is rainwater. In areas where drought periods are common, there is a tradition of rainwater harvesting. Every household for itself, as well as the whole village for everyone. This is a photo of an old, build, um, old big public rainwater harvesting system, so-called Gustirna, in Kut village. Due to contemporary global potable water scarcity problems and ever higher costs of water supply charged by potable water consumption, rainwater harvesting and use is getting more and more popular. Rainwater is relatively free from impurities and can be harvested in considerable amount, so it can replace potable water for a whole spectrum of purposes listed here. There are a couple of types of rainwater harvesting systems, but all include the following components. Catchment area, which is an impermeable surface, like roof or parking lot needed to capture the rainfall. Conveyance surface, appropriate piping and draining for transfer of the captured rainwater to potential treatment units and storage tanks. Then filtration, or treatment. Captured water often needs to be treated. This depends on the characteristics of the catchment area and the intended use of the collected water. Usually water collected from roofs has lower amounts of pollutants than those collected from pavements or parking lots and therefore requires less treatment. The treatment is primarily consisted of filtration by grade, sand filter and if higher water quality is needed microfilters. After filtration and treatment, the water is placed into a storage tank. Storage tank can be, for instance, a 200 liter barrel in this garden, so-called water bud. If rainwater is used only for gardening and similar purposes, this is a good option. Usually storage is on or underground tank that can store up to 6,500 liters of rainwater. Storage tank can also be installed in the loft so that only gravitation is used to distribute the water to the points of use. No pumps are necessary in that case. The volume of this kind of tanks is smaller so that the weight of stored water does not disturb the static of the building. No matter what type of storage tank is used, it needs to be fitted with an overflow system. Delivery systems is the last component of rainwater harvesting systems and it includes pipes, valves and pumps for transfer of collected rainwater to the point of use. If rainwater is planned to be used for drinking, additional treatment of water before getting to the faucet is necessary microfiltration and granulated activated carbon filtration, followed by disinfection by chlorine, ozone, UV light, membrane fil filtration and distillation. When rain showers get too frequent and too intensive, 
Rainwater harvesting system also plays a part in flood mitigation. Nowadays, flooding in populated areas seem to be very common. Why is that so? Let's take a look at Capture the Rain and Rebuild the Economy. It can happen here and find some possible answers. All that concrete and asphalt we built prevents water to penetrate the soil and aquifers or gets absorbed by plants and evaporates. Instead, this huge water mass is canalized by roads and while transferring street garbage and potentially mobilizing toxic substances, it enters a sewage system, it outgrew, bringing feces and urine to the surface and slowly encircling and overflowing buildings. Having that in mind, sustainable conversion of public places undoubtedly includes green roofs, tearing down some concrete in favor of gravel, bricks or other kind of permeable pavings in the garden and sustainable draining systems. Beautiful green roofs reduce flood intensities through evapotranspiration. In addition, they help reduce urban heat in the island effect, reduce energy costs with natural insulation, improve air quality, create peaceful retreats for people and animals and last longer than conventional roofs. More about environmental advantages of green roofs on here claimed links. Besides green roofs, Another element of green infrastructure are sustainable drainage systems, SUDs. SUDs are nature-mimicking landscapes composed of basins, rain gardens, swales, filter drains, bioretention basins, reed beds and other wetland habitats that collect, store and filter dirty water along with providing a habitat for wildlife. So here are the listed function of SUD and a picture so you can see how it really looks. SUDs and green roofs are elements of the so-called green infrastructure. Rather recently the city of New York invested a lot in it and it pays off. So for more about New York green infrastructure follow the link on the slide. Floods can be mitigated by means of green infrastructure, but they still happen from time to time. Check out this video clip on how to reuse stormwater made by folks at the Stanford University. Stormwater and rainwater are considered alternate water sources good enough for non-potable application along with wastewater that is divided into black water and grey water. Black water is toilet wastewater and usually contains feces and fecal pathogens. Grey water is more or less any type of wastewater except toilet wastewater. Considering contemporary water problems, using drinkable water for flushing doesn't make sense anymore. With alternate sources present, especially grey water that is available for reuse on everyday basis, whatever the weather conditions are, we have an opportunity to reduce overall potable water demand, cut costs and reduce water energy and chemicals consumption, as well as carbon emissions in wastewater treatment processes. To start this thing going, It is important to rearrange interconnect water supply and drainage system. Modern technologies allow treatment of grey water that enable uh, its use for drinking purposes. But public attitudes are still against this and accept grey water reuse for flushing and gardening purposes. The latter requires use of non-toxic and low sodium soap and personal care products in order to protect vegetation in your garden.
Optimal water management, integrated water management, takes into account all of the water resources and adjusts them according to the function of a public building. The city of San Francisco developed the whole non-potable water program in which quite a number of public buildings have been included. Let's take a look. No matter how much water is reused, in the end there is always some wastewater left. It can go directly to sewage or it can be treated on site by, for example, constructed wetlands. Wastewater contains organic matter, pathogens and heavy metals, can contain hormones and medicines, as well as toxic inorganic substances, but also contains nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus that are essential for the life of plants. If there is enough free surface area in the surroundings of a public building, wastewater could be locally treated and simultaneously used as manure for wetland plants that beautify the surroundings of a public building in so-called constructed wetlands. The product of this kind of wastewater treatment can again be used for sprinkling lawns and non-edible plants on the premises, as well as for flushing, car and street washing, fire extinguishing and so on. Maintenance costs of constructed wetlands are relatively low and city's sewage network and wastewater treatment plant could be very thankful for the lack of contribution. What exactly are constructed wetlands? They are man-made wetlands that rely on microorganisms, vegetation and physical and chemical reactions in the water column or substrate to remove suspended particles, organic matter, nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, heavy metals and pathogens from the wastewater that is flowing through the wetland. According to the water flow regime, there are two types of constructed wetland systems. Surface flow systems or free water surface constructed wetlands and subsurface flow systems or vegetated submerged bed wetlands. Both types are built on impervious bed, for example thick layer of clay. Surface flow constructed wetlands are closely mimicking natural wetlands. They consist of a series of ponds and channels up to one meter deep with free floating, emergent and submerged vegetation. But what is actually the function of vegetation in wastewater treatment process? There are many. Plants slow down the flow of water in the pond and therefore enhance settling of particles and organic matter. They produce oxygen and enable underwater oxidation and deterioration of organic matter. They use phosphorus and nitrogen for their growth and development, provide substrate for microorganisms that decompose organic matter and so on. Also, some plant species can accumulate heavy metals and salt. Nonetheless, microorganisms play a crucial role in biodegradation of the usual and toxic organic compounds. Let's see what other wastewater purification mechanisms are present in constructed wetlands. The wastewater usually enters constructed wetlands after some settling of sludge and removal of floating oil and grease in septic tanks. Then, in the ponds of surface flow systems, the water flows at low velocities, which enable settling of particles and precipitation of suspended solids. Microorganisms are attached to vegetation and suspended in the water column and they are responsible for the removal of soluble organic compounds. From one surface flow constructed wetland pond to the next, 
the water flows gravitationally. Surface flow systems are relatively easy to design and build, but require more land than subsurface flow systems for the same pollution reduction. Also, they attract mosquitoes and pose a greater risk of exposure of the public to pathogenic organisms and other harmful contaminants of wastewater being treated than subsurface flow constructed wetlands. In subsurface flow systems, water flows below ground surface through the substrate, filter material, stones, gravel, sand, either horizontally or vertically. This mechanism seems to be more efficient than surface flow constructed wetland and less risky for human health. The substrate as well as plant roots provide surface areas for bacterial biofilm grow. And plants transfer oxygen to deeper parts of the system, assimilate nutrients, thermally insulate the system and beautify the surroundings of the public building. Vertical subsurface flow constructed wetlands are fed two or four times a day, usually with a little help from pumps. Each time the top layer is flooded, wastewater gradually flows downwards through the substrate and is collected by draining pipes at the bottom. The system drains completely empty and this allows air to refill the bed, thus enabling aerobic reactions. Constructed wetlands are completely ecological systems and even though wastewater really is purified after passing through them, their effect cannot really be quantified and it depends on a lot of factors. Anyway, a lot less energy, heat and electrical is needed for this kind of wastewater treatment compared to classical wastewater treatment plants. As you might have noticed from everything here mentioned, water management is moving towards efficient, decentralized, integrated, fit for purpose and smart systems. Do read more about the history of water infrastructure development in The Role of Innovation in Urban Water Futures by Mr. Stuart White. To recap everything said, let's take a look at water-sensitive urban design video clip. Thank you very much. And remember, knowledge is worth little if not implemented.